So, problems with what, knowing what Jesus said. Problems with knowing what Jesus said. So scholars for 300 years have known that it is difficult to know what it is Jesus said. Uh, Megan told me earlier that you've had uh, Marcus Borg uh, here with you. I hope some of you heard Marcus Borg. Marcus was a member of a group called the Jesus Seminar. He probably talked about the Jesus Seminar here because it's hard to get him to talk about anything else sometimes. Uh, Marcus loved being part of the Jesus Seminar. And the Jesus Seminar was a group of scholars that got together uh, and decided on what parts of the gospel were historically reliable and which were not. They published an edition of the New Testament Gospels. In fact, they called it the Five Gospels because there's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and another gospel called the Gospel of Thomas that didn't make it into the New Testament. And what they did is they published this and they color-coded the words of Jesus to show which words he probably said and which ones he probably did not say. So in the judgment of these scholars, uh, the, the sayings that Jesus almost certainly said were in red, the ones that he said, kind of like what he said, were in pink. The ones that he probably didn't say those are in gray. And the ones he absolutely didn't say were in black. To the shock of many people reading this book, only 18% of the sayings are in red or pink. 82% of the sayings of Jesus are in black or gray. So... I wasn't on the Jesus Seminar. It's still going on, uh, doing other things now, but uh, I wasn't involved with them. Uh, I actually wasn't too surprised about the 18%. Uh, my problem was I thought they had the wrong 18%. <laughs> uh, but but, but I, I, I thought the number was about right. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> but it's just a difference of opinion. Uh, scholars have long known. Well, why, what's the problem? What, why is it hard to know what Jesus actually said? You've got Gospels. So here's the reality. Um, I, have a, I have a book coming out on this next month. I've got a book coming out in, uh, on March 1st that's dealing with just this problem, which is this. Jesus died around the year 30. Say 29, say 33, sometime around the year uh, 30, AD 30, or 30 CE, as we say in scholarship. 30 CE. The first gospel was Mark, written around the year 70. Last Gospel, John, written around 95, 90 to 95. There's 40 to 60 years between Jesus' death and the first accounts of his life. That'd be like having the words of a preacher from 50 years ago show up for the first time this week. Not based on previous research, but based like the first time this week. The stories about what Jesus said were being circulated by word of mouth year after year, decade after decade, for 40 to 60 years before anybody wrote them down. So these were not written by people who were taking uh, stenographic notes at the Sermon on the Mount. Th these are stories about what Jesus said by people writing decades later, which creates some kind of obvious problems in the Gospels. There are differences among our Gospels. I've pointed out one between John and the synoptics about whether Jesus calls himself God or not. But there are lots of differences. Uh, Matthew doesn't tell the same story as Mark. John has a completely different story. Luke is, they're all different from one another. And the problem is, a lot of the differences among the Gospels actually are discrepancies and contradictions. Now, I could be spending these three lectures talking about that, although you might find it a little old after a while, uh, my students do, but, but I could show you that there are discrepancies and contradictions in the Bible, that this is common knowledge among critical scholars of the New Testament, whether they're believers or non-believers, it's just a reality. Uh, what you need to do, if you don't believe this, all you need to do is take a story in Matthew and read the same story in Mark or in Luke and compare them carefully with one another word for word. Take the stories of Jesus' birth in Matthew and Luke. Compare them with one another and see if you can reconcile them. Take the stories of his resurrection in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and compare the stories. You'll find all sorts of differences in the resurrection narratives. The resurrection of Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Jesus is buried and somebody goes to the tomb. Who goes to the tomb? Women. How many women? Is it one woman? Depends which gospel you read. More than one? How many? Which ones? What are their names? Depends which gospel you read. 
What do they see there? It depends what gospel you read. Is the stone rolled away before they get there or after they get there? It depends which gospel you read. Are they told to go tell the disciples to go to Galilee to meet Jesus? Or are, they, are the disciples supposed to stay in Jerusalem to meet Jesus? It depends which gospel you read. Do they go to Galilee or do they stay in Jerusalem? It depends which gospel you read. Do the women tell anybody or not? It depends which gospel you read. It, they're up and down the line. You, and, you know, you don't have to take a scholar's word for it. You can simply do it yourself. There are different discrepancies and contradictions among the Gospels. The problem is if you've got two sources that are at odds with one another, they both can't be historically right. If you have two eyewitnesses to an event, for example, a car accident, and they contradict each other, one of them might be right, or they both might be wrong, but they both can't be right at the point of contradiction. Just how logic works. So, that's a problem. Not only are there discrepancies and contradictions, there are theological perspectives that vary from one gospel to another. John is unambiguous that Jesus is a divine being. As we'll see in uh, my next lecture, I'll talk about John's understanding of Jesus, which is quite a stunning understanding of who Jesus is. Other Gospels have other perspectives on who Jesus is. And they have different theological perspectives on lots of different things, as scholars have realized over the last uh, couple hundred years. There are two implications of these various differences among the Gospels. One is literary. A literary implication is that if you've got different accounts that are different from each other, you should not read each account as if it's saying the same thing as the other. Every account is different, which means when you read Mark, you shouldn't assume that he means the same thing that John means. If you read Matthew, you shouldn't assume he's saying the same thing that Luke's saying. These are different books. We tend to read them as if it's like one big book, but it's because when you buy them, they're between two hard covers, and it seems like one book. It's not one book. These are four books by four different authors. I would not like it at all if you read one of my books and a book by Jerry Falwell and assumed we were saying the same thing because we're two different authors. Uh, Matthew and Luke were two different authors. And so literarily, if you read one, you ought to let him have his say and let him say what he wants to say and not assume he's saying what someone else is saying. That's the literary implication, but of greater interest for us in these lectures is the historical implication which is that if these accounts are at odds with each other, then we have to engage in a historical reconstruction of what Jesus really said and did, because we can't simply list his sayings in the Gospels and say, these are the things he said. Because the Gospel writers are imposing their own views on Jesus' words, as did the storytellers before them, and the storytellers before them, and the storytellers before them. Whenever somebody would say, oh yeah, Jesus said this, they would shape what they had to say based on their understanding of things and how they wanted to portray Jesus' teachings. And that ended up changing the things he said. And so we have to know, what did he say? Well, historians have worked since the 1770s on this question. This has been around for a long time. Uh, a few years ago, uh, you may have noticed that there was a book on the historical Jesus by Reza Aslan. Did you all see this book called Zealot? It was number one on the New York Times bestseller list. Uh, and he has his view about what Jesus actually said uh, and what Jesus actually did. It is a very well-written book. I think I mean, it's a problematic book from a scholarly point of view for all sorts of reasons, but, but it was a very interesting book. And it was well-written. He's a professor of creative writing. <laughs> He's a creative writer. <laughs> it was a creatively written book. But, uh, but it, you know, a very interesting book. Uh, a few months later, it, got, it, it was well surpassed by uh, Bill O'Reilly's book on Jesus, Killing Jesus. You all know that book? Uh, you know Bill O'Reilly, the uh, Fox News commentator? <laughs> Bill O'Reilly's book, uh, he's certainly not a Jesus scholar. Uh, Bill, Bill O'Reilly's book, he, he, Bill O'Reilly thinks that what Jesus was upset about uh, in his own context was he was upset with the Roman domination of the promised land. He didn't like the idea that the Romans were dictating uh, were asserting their authority over the land of Israel, especially because they were forcing Israel to pay so much tribute. Jesus wanted smaller government and lower taxes. 
It's right there. <laughs> it's what he thinks. That's, that, that's, what, Jesus, that's what Jesus wanted. <laughs> so, so uh, right. So everybody from Bill O'Reilly to, uh, to raise a Haslin back over 300 years have realized that these, are, that these are problems. So how do we know what Jesus really said and did? 